So hello everyone and welcome to the second day of EDI 2020. Uh, my name is Iris Alfredsson and I will share the session on developing DDI. Uh, there will be a change in the program. So Alexander Meiro from Exastat is not able to participate today. So we will unfortunately not be able to listen to his presentation on data management, statistics and report being dri driven by DDI in the healthcare marketing area. So some housekeeping rules. Uh, this session will be recorded and due to the GDPR, attendees cannot see the list of other attendees. If you want others to see that you are here, you can say hi in the chat. You can also use Discord so that you can talk to other participants outside the presentations and you will find the link in the chat. Uh, we prefer that you use the Q&A section for questions. And we will take questions after each, each presentation and it will also be possible to ask questions to all presenters after the session. The first presenter is Thomas Kramer and he will give a presentation on Euro question um, Bank uh, and microservices and UI for field of the survey question search. Thomas joined GESIS in 2015 and is since then responsible for the implementation of GESIS data search. He contributed to assess the data catalog and it is lead developer for EQB. He has a master degree in digital humanities and social sciences. So Thomas, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining this session. So I'll uh, yeah, start right away. So I'll present the European Question Bank. And uh, yeah, so the presentation is uh, structured in uh, four parts. <clears throat> so I'll first quickly introduce the project itself and its motivation. I'll then talk about the user interface and show the basic functionalities. Then switch to the architecture and the various services that are required and uh, involved in the back, back end. And then talk about the requirements for service providers to join, to provide uh, their content to the Euro Question Bank. So the motivation for the EQB project is uh, um, actually a very clear one. So we have a few question data banks for social science survey questions, but they mainly operate at the national level, which leads to a limited pool of available questions. And this is what the EQB addresses. So we create a joint cross-national pool of questions, of fielded survey questions, and provide a central search facility for that. So the SESTA EQB project members uh, can be seen here on the map. So you might find your institution there. If not, uh, you can consider joining us. Um, and GESIS is the implementation lead, the technical lead of the project, uh, while the infrastructure itself is operated by SESTA. So the EQB runs on SESTA infrastructure. So um, the main use cases or the functionality that the EQB provides are to browse and to discover questions that have been fielded in uh, any of the member institutions, to access the study related information like the documentation and to compare and export survey items, questions to be reused in future surveys. We use the EQB metadata schema, which is um, divided into uh, mandatory and optional or recommended fields. In total, we've around 100 fields. And it's obvious that the question text the study title and publication here are mandatory ones. Uh, and we have a wide range of additional fields, such as the interviewer instructions or the sub-question text, and of course, the response categories. Um, 
So now I'll switch over to the UI presentation. So nothing surprising at the start page. It's a simple uh, screen where you have one search uh, input field. And uh, if you enter any of uh, your uh, preferred search terms, you're led to the result page. So it's um, a very classical setup. So you have your filters or the facets at the left side and the results in the, in the center part. And uh, what we see here is that we search for leftite uh, in all languages and all fields. So maybe a few remarks on the language concept or the language handling in uh, DQB. So as it's a cross national pool of questions and we address uh, well, all the member institutions, uh, we put a high emphasis on supporting languages. Uh, so there are at least two levels where we differentiate. So the language you want to search in and the language you want to see, you want to display, for example, in, in a comparison of questions of uh, multinational study series questions. Um, so on the top right, you see this all languages drop down. And currently we, we have no selection made. So we search for left tide in all fields and all languages. We can change that. So we've currently something like I think about 25 language analyzers, which means that for each of the fields that supports multiple languages, we apply language specific analysis during indexing time. Uh, the, the most common one is of course stemming. And you can now select the language you want to search in and the stemming and or, or the other language specific analysis will be applied to your search. But this is different from the display language, but let's come to that later. So what you see if we, if I now selected Spanish as my search language, we have a few filters on the left side, the question text, the study titles, the pre and post question text, and there are a few more that now are also limited to values that are available in Spanish. So on the next slide, we see that uh, we are now searching for left tide only in question texts, not in all the fields. And uh, this is, um, um, yeah, actually the point, this gives you the possibility to, um, um, yeah, um, search very specifically within just specific fields and to, um, yeah, slice and dice the results to your needs. Mm. Okay, then uh, coming to the display language. So um, you can log in to the EQB and then you have some additional functionalities. So we'll come to the basket and the export later. But the most common one is that you can set your preferred display language. This means that, for example, if you want to see results in Swedish language, if it's available, you put, well, you, you select Swedish as your preferred content language. And then in the case that there are Swedish results, you will, you will see that. If not, you will see that some of those texts here, in this case, it's the study title of the first result, European Value Studies, it's gray. This means that it's not available in my preferred language, but still the system will show you any language that's present. So ideally English, which is the lingua franca. If not, it will show well the, the least or the, the only available language. And it will also be, it will also show a tooltip so that you know which language is currently displayed in the case you can't decipher it. Um, as you can see, we support uh, various alphabets um, as uh, well, it's an international uh, platform. So it should be able to handle the different alphabets. Um, yeah, so as uh, one shortcut to the content, um, you see, you can see the response categories right away from the result list by clicking on the button. You see here that uh, also the documentation is available uh, in the result list, but it'll only be displayed if it's available in the metadata. 
Um, yeah, so you see the order of the response categories as they appeared in the questionnaires, in the original questionnaires, the answer code, and the, the label or the response category in the ILM. <clears throat> then if you click on question details, you will see, uh, no surprise, the details of that specific question. You can see here that uh, we have a, a bunch of fields that we display and also that uh, the questions are urgent, which means you can use the comparison function we'll see in a second also to compare different versions of the questions across uh, uh, a longitudinal study, for example, if you want to see how the wording has changed. Um, so here we see the study details page. Um, as said, each question belong, each, each question belongs to study, and therefore you uh, see the question, the study information right right away. You see in what languages it is available, for example, and also some additional information like the methodology, uh, including the time dimension, the sampling procedure, or the data collection mode. Then, if available, if it's uh, present in the metadata, we also link directly to the additional material of a study, like the codebook, uh, data set if they are published, or the questionnaires, or whatever it be. Then, uh, as mentioned, uh, we have uh, two special functionalities, uh, well, in particular the comparison functionalities. You see in this screen a little uh, shopping cart, uh, shopping basket, and a list item, which are blue in the, or two files in the first result. This means that I selected right from the result list that question to my basket, and in this case, also in the comparison list. So by simply clicking these symbols, you can either add all the results that you see on your search page. In this case, it's the 10 results that I have on this, on this result page. Uh, to the basket or to the comparison, or you can scroll and select specific ones. <clears throat> this is the comparison view, which we designed in a way that it is um, well, as easy as possible to directly compare side-by-side -side questions. That means even if fields are empty, in this case, the field post question text are empty for all of the questions, um, we still display uh, this, the same, uh, we, we occupy the same space so that you have a tabular like view to compare um, the different attributes of questions. Also here you can switch the language, the translations of a question right away. Um, so uh, in, in the EQB, um, a question is uh, available in various languages so means it's this, it's the, it has got one identity, the question has got one identity, uh, but it has various translations. And this view helps to um, compare different translations, but also different versions. So if you, if you put, for example, the same uh, question of uh, various uh, um, uh, study series in, in the comparison list, you can compare different versions of that question side by side. You also see the answer codes and also the response categories at the bottom. And then the basket, it's actually quite uh, simple. So uh, it's, it's like a clipboard. You can put the um, questions you're interested in to that basket, and then you can either export them one by one or all in one as one single PDF. We're also working on providing that uh, as XML or DTI information. Then uh, a few figures on what's in. So we currently have uh, 302 studies in and counting. So we're of course in the process of importing more studies. And uh, these uh, studies have uh, questions in 55, countries, or to be more specific, it's actually countries and languages spoken in uh, that countries. Um, so take, for example, um, uh, a question uh, 
fielded in Estonia and asked in Russian language. So this will be count as one different uh, yeah, language variant. And in total, we've got uh, about 37,000 questions in the EQV at the moment. Then a few remarks on the architecture. So um, we uh, have a microservice architecture, which means that several small components are involved in the entire pipeline. So let's start with the providers like UKDA, SMB, Force, or maybe you in the future. Um, so the main um, input uh, or the main inflow of metadata is by using the established open archives indicative uh, protocol for metadata harvesting. So we've got a harvester that harvests DDI metadata. There are also some institutions that have no OAI server. So we provide a file-based harvesting, harvesting mechanism, which means that we check regularly for a, a zip or a tar GZ archive on a specific location, download it and unpack it. Then we've got one huge folder, one drive, where all those metadata is unpacked. And then we've got an import component that imports this into the FlatDB. It might be in some of the cases that we apply a conversion. So uh, many different, many institutions use different uh, versions of DDI, different from 3.2, which is the standard uh, and the default version of DDI that the service providers should provide. But some are, are still working on 2.5, for example. And at Gesis, we developed uh, a converter component, which is capable to convert a 2.5 DDI, for example, to 3.2. So all the metadata is then available in the FlatDB. And then we've got an indexing component, which pushes all those metadata into an Elasticsearch index. And finally, the search UI, which I just presented, uh, which is accessing that search index and providing means to search and compare and browse for the end users. So um, a few uh, challenges that we encountered in the past few months during the implementation. So one is, of course, the different DDI versions and uh, the interpretations or the, let's say, the dialects used at different institutions. Um, we addressed this by the DDI converter I just mentioned. Uh, I'd like to point you to a presentation which will take place later today in the afternoon uh, that covers exactly that topic. So a converter from DDI from codebook to lifecycle which might be interesting for those of you who uh, are still using 2.5 or even 1.2. Um, then another challenge was that the service providers have a hard time providing DDI compatible files. So we see that there is definitely a regular support and, and feedback needed from our side when we uh, import the files, we see what, what uh, problems arise. One is, for example, the, the different versions of subcomponents of an EDI file. Um, so not the question itself, but uh, maybe other attributes of uh, DDI. And this is uh, where uh, yeah, we are in constant interaction with our service providers. But the most obvious challenge is that most service providers, or many service providers, uh, do not have question level metadata documentation. So studies are documented, are documented, but not necessarily at question level. Uh, so the mitigation for this would be to use questionnaire editing tools, such as the Gezes questionnaire editor, to also annotate and document the question level properly. And then, as we have seen, our EQB supports uh, a wide range of language-specific functionalities. 
the basic requirement for this is of course that uh, the, XM, the, the language attribute is indicated. So we see that sometimes there's no language attribute at all, which makes it different to select the right uh, stemmer, for example, um, and also makes it a bit different, uh, difficult to design the user interface to handle those well, non-existing uh, information. So um, yeah, um, if you want to be part of the EQV, feel free to contact me or any other of the team. And uh, so the requirements uh, are actually uh, quite clear. So you can uh, contact us. You can, if, if you used uh, DBI already, and, uh, and of course you should have uh, metadata at question level for, for sure. And then if you uh, have an OAI endpoint of your metadata of your DBI in uh, any of the supported formats that we convert, then we're actually ready to, uh, to include you in the EQV if you like. Okay, I think that's it for the moment as a first introduction of the EQV. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, very interesting. And we are looking forward to the launch of the E2B. Do you know when it will be? Um, right now, we are in the process of uh, yeah, uh, meeting the quality, the software quality requirements. So we are writing tests for those uh, parts of the software that are still uncovered. And we plan to have a better release in very early 2021. So I expect the EQB available in about yeah, February. So three months, two months, three months. Yeah, we are looking forward to that. It looks like a very interesting tool. I have some questions here from, it's one from John Johnson. How do you support code lists for questions from DDI Codebook or Nestor? Um, Good question. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Ezra is in the participants list. Ezra Akenis. Well, apparently not. Um, I'm afraid I can't answer uh, to that question. Uh, I have another question here from Hilda Orton. Uh, thank you very much. Great tool. I realize you have a three-digit versioning system. Could you please explain how this works in EQB? Um, well, again, I'm uh, afraid that the um, versioning is uh, defined in the system metadata model. Uh, I'd have to look up that myself to see uh, what, uh, so what kind of semantic versioning or other versioning concept is behind that, uh, but I'm, uh, yeah, but I'm uh, happy to provide information in the documentation of the session later on. Okay, thank you. I can't see any more questions. Uh, if you have questions for Thomas, you can put them in. Yes. Okay, I have an answer here from Benjamin. Uh, the version comes from the imported metadata, I suppose. The answers. Yes, that's okay. If, if this was the question, that's for sure. Uh, it's not. It's not a versioning that we apply. It's definitely so. The let's say the governance of the versioning is not at EQB. The governance of the versioning is at the institution side. So this is why I was a bit uh, surprised with that question. So it's uh, in the responsibility of the um, yeah of the uh, institution. Okay, Hilda say thanks. So uh, I can't see any more questions for you, Thomas, now, but if you, there are more questions on, EQ, of, um, on the EQB, you can put them in the question and answer, um, cat, uh, and um, we will have answers at the end of this session. <coughs> okay. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. And now um, we have our next presenter, uh, Jane Fry and she will present the DDI Alliance Training Committee, what's it all about. So Jane Fry is the data service librarian at Carleton University, Ottawa, Canada. 
and uh, research data management and DDI are two of her main areas of responsibility. And she is the lead for our Carlton's Institutional Strategies Working Group. She's also on a number of other local, national, and international committees, including co chair of the DDI Training Committee, chair of the ODC Data Deposit Policy Working Group, and member of the National RDM Training Working Group. So, Jane, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Iris. I will just uh, share my screen here. Can everyone see that okay? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Good morning, all. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you, Thomas, uh, for that uh, presentation. I'm quite looking forward to getting into the question bank and playing around with it. I also want to uh, thank you, Iris, for chairing this session and thank you, Lucy, for looking after any technical issues that come up because that's very important to have at these conferences. And finally, thank you to all of the participating participants for coming this morning. Um, I want to apologize at the beginning for any fumbling around that I may do during my presentation because you see it's about half past four in the morning here in Ottawa and I hope I've had enough coffee but we will see. Okay, so I'm going to be talking to you first a bit about the DDI Alliance, but most of my time is going to be spent on the training committee. What are we doing now? What do we want to do? And how you can help if you want to. So the DDI Alliance is a self-sustaining member organization created in 2003. If you're planning on implementing DDI in your institution, you should look into the DDI Alliance because being part of it means being able to give input when they are discussing changes, edits, and new formatting. So it's really neat that the members really do have a voice in DDI development. If this is what you're interested in, please contact Jared Lyle, the executive director, and he'll give you all the information you need. Also, all this information is online, so you can check it out yourself if you want to. Uh, the membership, the charter, the bylaws, the forms, and uh, public publications, conferences, and working groups. So the organization itself consists of an executive board, and they are the policy-making and oversight body of the alliance. Then there's a scientific board, which is responsible for the work to develop the standard. There's also the technical committee who maintain the various DDI products in collaboration with the different working groups of the DDI Alliance. And these working groups are convened to work on different activities and topics within the work areas of the DDI Alliance. Currently, there are six working groups and the training committee is one of those working groups. Okay, so the DDI Alliance training committee was thoroughly reorganized in 2019. It started with Jared Lyle appointing two new co-chairs, Anya Perry from GASIS and myself. Our initial task was to update the mandate. After we did that, we put out a call for new members with the result that the overall membership of the committee was expanded to 15 members and they were asked for a two-year commitment. We started having our meetings in January of this year. The purpose of the training group, this is our mandate that I'm going to talk about now, is to introduce people to DDI and to improve people's competence in working with DDI. We are also to gear our training to specific audiences. As well, we are to develop expertise within the community for training purposes. Now this is very important as currently there are only a small number of people who are available for training and they are not always available to do it. As well, we are to maintain a training library with updated training material for reuse. Now, I want to talk here a bit about the term training library because we do have this term in the mandate, but when you look on the web page once we've redone it, it will not become it will not be called a training library because we've discovered that the term library has a different meaning for different people and we want everyone going to the web page to understand what they are looking at. So every time I use training library in the presentation, remember that it will one day be called training materials. Here's a list of the members who are in the training group. And I noticed that there are a couple of them here in the audience today. And it's great to have you here. Uh, 
Kaya and uh, I think I saw Kaya and Lucy, of course, and Hilda. Um, there's a star beside Martine's name because unfortunately she had to leave the committee due to other commitments at work. And I want to mention that this is an international committee, so it's great to have input from all the different areas. Collaboration is very important for our training committee. And within the DDI Alliance, we work with marketing and partnerships. One of the things we're doing is putting together some short videos. We're also working with the technical committee and making sure that uh, we look after the training pages, but they get to look after uh, all the technical pages. Another uh, important thing which uh, Anya and I take part in are quarterly meetings with uh, other members of the DDI Alliance Executive, uh, including the chair of the scientific board, the chair of the technical committee, and the chair of the marketing committee, among a couple others. Because it's really important for us to know what's happening in the Alliance so we can work together when possible. At these meetings, uh, either Anya and I discuss what the training committee has been doing and what we will be doing, and we solicit feedback from the others that are there. I want to tell you a bit about our monthly meetings. Uh, the first three meetings, we talked about what do we want to do? What do you think of the mandate? Is there anything else that we should be doing? And it was really important for Anya and I at these first three meetings because we wanted the group to be engaged. And the best way to make sure that everyone is engaged is to make sure we are all working towards a common goal. And these were quite interesting meetings. There was never any point that ever any, everyone was just sort of sitting there thinking and no one was talking. So it was really good to get everyone's input. Some other interesting discussions we've had that have taken up the whole of the meetings are which Creative Commons license to use and how to give proper attribution to the authors. That was a very important discussion. But Anya and I also realized that while it is important to have these high level discussions, there was still work to be done. So another development in the training committee was the formation of four new working groups. It happened quite organically. It wasn't anything Anya and I had planned, but it came from the discussions we'd had at the first three meetings. So four groups just sort of formed naturally. The members chose which groups they wanted to be involved in, and each subgroup came up with their own mandate. They were the ones who were going to be doing the work, so it was important that they understood and agreed what they would be working on together. And then there is a report back to the larger training committee group on a monthly basis. And this report back is important because the different working groups, subgroups, have activities which are overlap, overlapping and complementary with each other. So the training opportunity subgroup is the first group I'm going to talk about. The chair is Hilda Orton. This is the mandate. It is to look for upcoming conferences to showcase DDI and to look for opportunities to collaborate as well to figure out how to deal with training requests. So the tasks broke down to coming up with a training request form to go on the web, collaborating with the marketing group, and approaching other organizations to collaborate. And this group has already had meetings with CoData and made contact with different interest groups within RDA. They have also put together the training request form which you can find on the DD Alliance, DDI Alliance website. And the link is in uh, the title of uh, where it says request a training session. So if you want to go to it, once you get the slides, you'll be able to uh, check it out. Now, the information that is on this page includes that uh, someone requesting the inf a training session has to fill out. It includes the institution or organization's background information. So, of course, the name, the primary function of this organization and their location. Then there is a section for contact information for the person filling out the form, including if they are new to DDI. After that is a section on training or consultation request details, such as the timing. How long do they want training for? Do they just want an hour's worth of training, a half a day, or a few days of training? As well, what will be the audience for the training? Will it be librarians? Will it be developers? Who will it be? And what language are they hoping the training will be in? As well, the type of training. For example, do they just want beginner training on DDI? Or is there a certain DDI product that they want us to talk about? We also want to know the number of participants and if there are any available resources. 
and any other information they come up with. Once this form is filled out, it goes to the Training Opportunity subgroup who will then answer it. And it really only takes a few minutes to fill out this form. So we're really pleased that this is up on the website for anyone to fill out. The next subgroup is the Slide Deck Review subgroup and the chair is Haley Mills. Their mandate is to review all of the slide decks in depth. So the tasks include going through the existing presentations and checking whether each one is complete and can be passed on for editing. By the way, I will be talking about these slide decks in a minute to tell you more about them. Now for those slide decks that are incomplete, what is still needed? And are all of the slides consistently branded? Now if there's any need for additional material, this group will inform the gap analysis subgroup. Because these are the same slide decks that the gap analysis group is looking at, but they are looking at them from a different angle. The gap analysis subgroup is chaired by Dan Gilman. Its mandate is to look at what topics or slides are missing from the current slide decks. So they don't go as in-depth into the slide decks as the previous subgroup goes into. <clears throat> this group reviews them and puts together a list of the current topics and they determine which topics are missing. Now I mentioned to you the slide decks that to these two groups are looking at. So the materials <clears throat> come from the last workshop at Schloss Stangstuhl in 2018. <clears throat> I should explain in case anyone doesn't know what Schloss Stangstuhl is. The DDI Alliance has a strong relationship to this internationally renowned informa informatics center in Germany. Since 2007, there have been over 24 DDI expert and training workshops that have been held in this extraordinary venue. And I was lucky enough to attend one of the earlier workshops. And it really was quite an exciting experience. And we got an awful lot of work done in one week. So the topics of the slide decks, the first number of slides that uh, will be put out soon are, <clears throat> excuse me, what is DDI? What is metadata? DDI codebook, DDI lifecycle, and DDI CDI. A slide deck on DDI for librarians and archivists one on variables and variable cascades, and one on representations in codes and categories. In total, there are about 15 slide decks. And I say about because some of them ended up being split into separate files to be more usable, and they still have to be finalized. The last subgroup I'm going to talk to you about is the Training Web Pages subgroup. And this is chaired by Marta Limert, and I am part of this subgroup. Our mandate is to update the current training pages on the DDI Alliance website. So our tasks include reviewing the current pages, identifying any missing topics, and then updating them. So first of all, we had to review the pages that were there to see if indeed they were training web pages or if they belonged to the technical committee. And any that had the technical information on them went right to the technical committee. And uh, currently we are updating them. And this is a fairly lengthy process. One of the things we also did was come up with a new structure, which will be implemented in the new year for the training web pages. And since it's just a proposed uh, structure, I'm just uh, putting up a diagram here that Marta put together for us. So the Learn tab is where you will be finding all of the training materials. And then just what you will be expecting will be under there. What is DDI? Why use it? And how to use it? Then there will be the training materials or the training library, as I referred to it. But it will be called the training materials so that everyone will understand what is under that tab. Next is the request training tab. And that is where you will find the training form that I talked about earlier. Now under resources, this is for those folks who are much more familiar with DDI and they want more high level technical data. And they, the technical committee will be the one looking after those particular tabs there in a lighter color. Then of course, there's a glossary and FAQ. The other tab that the training committee is looking after is the events tab. And there you can get for the past and present different workshops, different webinars, conferences, and the events at Schloss Dagstuhl. So we are hoping that this will just make it real easy for people coming to the DDI Alliance website for the first time who don't know much about DDI and want to find out more about it. This is who 
this proposed new stru training structure is geared towards. Now, I want to talk to you a bit about Zenodo. And just in case anyone doesn't know what it is, um, it's a general purpose open access repository with, that was developed under the European Open Air Program and operated by CERN. It allows researchers to deposit research papers, data sets, research software reports, and any other research related digital artifacts. And it's been around since May 2013. The reason I want to talk to you about this is Anya has put together a DDI training library or training materials in Zenodo. So this will be a product of our DDI training group. It will offer the slides to use for training on, on DDI under the CC BY license. Now the list of uh, slides that I mentioned earlier, there were five or six on the screen. These will be in this training materials group. The reason we are putting them in here is that if anyone needs to do give training to any of their colleagues, instead of having to come up with the slides on their own, they can just go to this training materials, find what they are looking for and use those slides after making sure, of course, they give correct attribution to the authors. So we're trying to help everyone out so they don't have to come up, spend the time coming up with their own training materials. Or another thing you can do is uh, just get the link for one of the sets. If you're interested in helping uh, some librarians know about DDI, you can just give them the link to the slide decks for DDI for librarians and let them look at it on their own and then come back to you with questions. So the curation policy for this particular group is that only training slides approved by the DDI Alliance will be made available here. But if you want to publish your own DDI workshop slides on Zenodo, there is another group community that you can publish them on, and that is the DDI community. This was also set up by Anya. Now, they will accept submissions of openly available DDI training material, which can be used by others either in a class environment or for self-teaching. For example, any of the presentations from Eddie can be put into this particular community. Or I know that uh, Eddie also has its own Zenodo community up for the conference. So the DDI community can be tagged in there so that the presentations can be seen by both communities. These submissions should use a CC BY license and clearly specify authorship as well as the different topic areas, language and confirmation and any other information that will help users to find appropriate learning resources. There isn't very much in these two Zenodo communities right now, but we're hoping within the next few months there will be a lot more that will be shareable to anyone else who's interested in accessing them. Okay, what do we plan on doing in the future? Well, we definitely want to be reaching out to new audiences. You know, we're, we've listed some audiences we are targeting right now, including librarians, developers, uh, managers, but are there other audiences out there that we should be reaching out to? We're not sure yet, and we're exploring this. We will also be developing new training materials, and this won't necessarily be us doing it. We could be asking, for example, the technical committee to be coming up with training materials for a DDI CDI. We're also going to be putting together some short videos so if someone just wants to watch a short video under 10 minutes on what is DDI and how to use it, it will be available for them. <clears throat> it's also important for us to be collaborating with other organizations such as GoFair, and that's why we do have a presentation at the uh, FAIR Symposium, um, RDA Research Data Alliance, and CoData. And we are looking into uh, other organizations. So if there's anyone you think we should be collaborating with, please let us know. And on that note, if you have any ideas for us, for the training committee, please send an email to Anya or to myself. We are interested in hearing what you have to, uh, what you think we should be looking at. And I wanna mention here that there was a time limit on how long I could talk. So I've only told you about some of the things that the DDI training committee has done and continues to work on. My presentation is like showing you the tip of an iceberg. I also want to mention uh, on a personal note that this is really a great committee and Anya and I appreciate the hard work everyone puts into it. And I definitely appreciate all of the hard work that Anya does. She's a great co-chair and I continue working. I enjoy quite it working with her. So thank you and uh, I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you, Gay, and uh, thank you the whole, to the whole DDI Alliance uh, Training Committee for all the, the great job you are doing. 
um, it looks really, really interesting. Um, I can't see that we have any questions. Uh, so please, if you have questions to Jane, uh, put them in the question and answer section. But I also think that your, your um, presentation was so clear that we, we all now is looking forward to, to, to use your training materials and to meet at the, an event uh, arranged by, by the committee. That's great. Yeah, yeah and send, yeah. send us an email by all means. You know, you may come up with ideas later on and we're open to hearing them or to answering your questions. Yeah, so if there is no questions for, for Jane right now, you can put them in the, the question and answer section and she will answer them after the, the next presentation. And the next presentation will be from Maya Dolinar. And she will, have, will talk about usability of DDI for addressing the issues of ethnographic data. And Maya is the head of digital preservation at the Slovenian Social Science Data uh, Archive at the University of Ljubljana. She is responsible for updating the policies, documentation and workflows in connection with long-term storage and acquiring and maintaining certificates. So Maya, please. Yes, I'll share my screen. Um... It's okay, you see it? Yes. Okay, uh, so my paper concerns the usability of DDI for addressing the issues of ethnographic data. Uh, I firstly started to think about this topic late uh, back in 2018 when I attended the Empirical Humanities Metadata Working Group of the Research Data Alliance at the RDA's 12th plenary meeting in Botswana. Uh, the aim of this working group is to conduct research and develop an adoptable and adaptable protocol for designing metadata management plans in empirical humanities projects. Uh, I'm not sure how much this group is active these days since there are no new developments on its webpage. However, it got me thinking about this topic. Interestingly enough, uh, the session was attempted by many anthropologists, including myself. So the discussion ended up being focused on addressing ethnographic data with the main question about the purpose of metadata either for discovery or reuse or both. It was agreed actually that reuse in anthropology does not simply happen. Data collection is always from a researcher's perspective and all this is inevitably inflicted in the data. In example, field notes uh, here researchers would usually revolve around the idea that nobody will know what they were thinking about when they made a certain note. However, this is precisely the point where the metadata comes in. Uh, my paper will not really present concrete examples or how to use DDI to address these challenges, but is more of a, let's say, exploratory analysis of the challenges of ethnographic data sharing and using, of course, metadata to share uh, this kind of uh, data. So what, uh, what is actually qualitative data? Qualitative data includes a broad range of types and forms of information and is sometimes defined as any information or data that is unstructured. Unstructured data includes all types of data that is not discrete in that there are many possible measurements, characteristics or dimensions present and is not organized based on a predefined framework. Most raw qualitative data, including text, image, images and audio and video is considered unstructured. In practice, qualitative data includes written responses from open-ended interview questions, transcripts of recorded interviews or focus group sessions, field notes and written observations. One of the primary barriers to sharing data within the empirical humanities is a lack of agreed upon protocols for choosing metadata standards for user-created primary research data. While there has been a great deal of work in the cultural heritage arena, especially with museums and libraries, and the dilemmas of qualitative data reuse are well documented. The issues associated with preparing data for later use by third parties are yet to be thoroughly conceptualized. Metadata is particularly complex and dynamic in the empirical humanities, even more so when this research is collaborative. Empirical material often has limited or contested provenance information. The empirical itself can shift in relevance or prevalence as analytic structures evolve and multiply. 
qualitative interviews, for example, are not just collected, they are produced for questions and other elicitation techniques developed by the interviewer. Interviewers are then analyzed, again, using analytic structures developed within complex traditions of thought. If interviews are analyzed collaboratively, different analytic structures may be used by different researchers or different researchers may deploy the same analytic structure in different ways and come to maybe different interpretations of what an interview, an image or a document says. Uh, metadata functionality does needs to be in place at many stages in the ethnographic research process addressing diverse types of data, including analytic structures used to produce and interpret empirical data. And this makes selecting metadata standards and structuring and managing metadata in an empirical humanities project particularly challenging. Uh, characteristics of ethnographic data in, and some of the open science principles are defined in the EASA Statement on Data Governments in Ethnographic Projects. This is the European Association of Social Anthropologists and in a document, the Data Governments Framework for Ethnography, version 1.0. Looking more closely to the statements on data governments and ethnographic projects, there are several issues exposed. First is the issue of data ownership as ethnographic materials are co-produced by researchers and research participants and embedded in a particular social context. Uh, the use of standard intellectual property licenses and protocols may not apply to all ethnographic materials. The second challenge is the challenge of archiving as ethnographic research data are always part of social relations and that's not always easily archived. The archiving of ethnographic materials will require specific technical features such as different roles for access, editing, sharing or privacy not available in most institutional repositories. Then we have issues of consents uh, since dynamics of ethnographic participation does not always enable obtaining prior informed consent from participants. Uh, for ethnographers, informed consent is basically an ongoing process. Then we have a challenge of custodianship as researchers bear the responsibility for ethnographic materials that are usually negotiated with research participants. There are possibilities of embargo in cases where materials cannot be anonymized or turned into data entries. And there are issues of public access and sharing because making such materials accessible may require special technical features that are again not available in most institutional repositories. Two major challenges for sharing and reusing all types of data are the identification of appropriate infrastructure for depositing and accessing data and the creation of standardization of metadata that can provide adequate information for the reuse of data in new analysis. Issues that need addressing are the open-ended nature of ethnography. Ethnographers cannot anticipate when and how data will yield itself for observation it is not always possible to preformat its appearance and recollection, nor indeed its future uses. And therefore, some processing of data is needed after the data collection and prior to archiving. Uh, so the second issue is that ethnographers is sometimes irreducible to consent, which is, which is what I mentioned before already. Uh, ethnographers also carry out fieldwork in contexts trained by political uh, violence often or conflict. In this context, should ethnographic data fall into the wrong hands, it could have very serious consequences for some of the vulnerable groups uh, with whom ethnographers work. Uh, working in or with third countries um, is also an issue because the GDPR prohibits in principle the transfer of data to countries outside the EU unless the latter have adequate levels of protection and regulations in place. And this could potentially pose a problem for anthropologists who have a long tradition of doing field work outside their home countries, uh, uh, for example, in the global south. Uh, ethnograph ethnographic data is rarely owned by researchers. Uh, much ethnographic data is produced collaboratively and remains alive before beyond act the actual moment of collection. Digital infrastructures should there, therefore allow for data to be remediated by such ongoing collaborative and processual relations for example, by incorporating features for version control, reuse, commentary, annotation, or edit in different degrees, forms, and formats by different parties. It is also not uncommon for ethnographers to work with indigenous communities whose systems of knowledge and cultural materials do not conform and cannot be translated into regime, regimes of intellectual property rights and whose management, of course, requires specific protocols of access, use, and legibility. Digital platforms should therefore allow for the registry and application of different legal licenses and labels to ethnographic materials. 
Digital infrastructure should allow for defining and specifying different roles and levels of access within a system, for example, researcher, administrator, contributor, guest, collaborator, etc. It should also be possible to control the availability of it or appearance of different layers and bundles of content, for example, by making certain types of content open, restricted, restricted private, editable, shareable, etc. Ethnographic data is sometimes bestowed to researchers in recognition to their own role as custodians or stewards of a community's cultural heritage. The long-term preservation of this material is therefore of paramount importance and the researchers should only deposit it in a dig digital archive if there are safeguards and guarantees in regards of the infrastructure's long-term socio-technical sustainability. Metadata standards are well established within and across many quantitative fields of study and are generally built into digital data repositories in the form of fields that researchers must fill out to characterize their own data. For data from the social, economic, behavioral and health sciences, the Data Documentation Initiative provides extensive metadata guidance for many forms of quantitative human subject research. A DDI working group has developed a data model for qualitative data, which includes a wide range of characteristics of the data and objects related to the data that must ideally be documented in order to provide adequate information to make qualitative data reusable. The UK Data Archive has extended the DDI model to create the qualitative data exchange schema with the primary goal of addressing the need to heavily mark up digital files to create comprehensive metadata for qualitative data. As noted by the DDI Working Group, a major challenge of generating comprehensive metadata for a qualitative collection or set of primary data artifacts that relate to one another is how to basically account for the particularities uh, of specific portions or segments uh, of qualitative data. Due to the richness of the information included in, uh, for example, in the transcripts of qualitative interviews, then there may be several contextual information contained in such, uh, such data that allow knowledgeable readers to infer the interview even if basic identifying information is removed. Uh, Jonathan Alexander in the, in the paper that I'm quoting below the table uh, allow uh, basically uh, propose a framework that is specific to qualitative data in its many forms. This framework allows researchers to consider both aspects of data sharing at the same time and highlights the relationship between data type and appropriate level of processing and access. The levels of processing proposed in this table reflect the fact that processing both increases the confidentiality and protection of sensitive information within data artifacts, as well as provides increasingly standardized and summarized descriptions of the research context and methodology, as well as the data themselves. Highlighting both aspects of processing underscores the point that raw data is not always more useful analytically or for future reuse, and also reflects the common observation in qualitative research that all data is a representation of reality and therefore already processed in the sense of being partial or somewhat summative. An entire data deposit can have a single consistent level of processing or different artifacts or types of qualitative data within a deposit can be provided at different levels of processing depending on their characteristics. The levels of access defined in this table integrate the language and approaches used by several of the leading uh, data repositories uh, for social or qualitative data, including uh, QDR, uh, ICPCR and UK Data Archive. The specific mechanism and technologies used to facilitate each level of access are variable and in this framework uh, the focus is not how but on why the data are subject to certain level of access restrictions. And here we have a level of access from open to uh, basically totally closed. Uh, this table depicts its, uh, shows basically some types of qualitative data, some examples uh, and analysis for four uh, uh, projects defined by the type of qualitative data. Each is presented in a different color and this situates possible levels of uh, processing and associated levels of access for each type of data. The project shown in red text uh, represents research using public policy documents as secondary qualitative data. The project in green text represents research using image, images of a political rally or protest as primary and or secondary qualitative data. And the project in blue represents research using interview transcripts and field notes as primary qualitative data. 
The project in pink uh, represents research using photographs and ethnographic field notes of, sens of sensitive location as the primary qualitative data. Um, these four examples are only a small sample of possible qualitative content, of course. Uh, this matrix or set of example highlights, uh, and nevertheless, the diversity of data types, research settings, and ethical and epistemological commitments that must be basically accounted for when making decisions about the level of access and the level of processing at which to share qualitative data. As shown in these examples, increased processing does not necessarily mean that more open access will be immediately appropriate if the research context is sensitive or if the researcher has not provided adequate metadata for interpretation of data. Uh, the upside of the development of data metadata standards for qualitative data and an, and an orientation towards fair principles is that much of this uh, metadata can be organized and presented in ways that are, are then similar across data sources, which in turn increases the likelihood of reuse for synthesis. However, the downside of relying on metadata to address epistemological challenges is basically the amount of time it can take for a researcher to generate adequate uh, content and provide enough detail to ensure both uh, research and, and research subject perspectives are thoroughly documented. Continued discussion is needed about the types and structures of metadata that can provide necessary, sufficient, and basically appropriate details that reflect various epistemological orientations of uh, and as, uh, uh, of this kind of data. So this would be all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Maya, for this interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I'm looking at the question and answer section. There is still no questions for you. So please, if you have questions for Maya, uh, write them in the Q&A section. Um, I think you have noticed that there has been some responses on the questions asked after the first presentations in the chat. So uh, you can go there and see Ezra's answers. Okay, so if there are no questions, uh, I have to thank all the uh, presenters for their presentations and all the participants for, for, for being here.